it's important to keep an eye not just on the subcultures, communities, and fandoms that we're a part of, like gaming, but also our neighboring subcultures that often cross-pollinate. I know that many of my viewers are not tuned in to what's going on in the world of science fiction and fantasy literature, but as many games draw inspiration from literature of the fantastic, it's important to familiarize yourself with the struggles going on in that arena. Tonight, I'm bringing you a story that will seem familiar even to those who have not been keeping track of science fiction and fantasy literature. As a wise anonymous fellow once observed, no subculture is being left untouched, and it's important to recognize the patterns and learn how to counter them together, as our wills combined are stronger than if we stay divided. Our story begins in the year 1996, when Harlan Ellison went on his sci-fi channel show to proclaim that the Hugo Award was dead. That thanks to the power of the internet, it was now possible for writers to launch online campaigns to get on the ballot, regardless of the quality of their work itself. He said that from that point on, the award meant far less than it had when it was given to winners in past years. But what are the Hugo Awards, you may ask? It's a science fiction award voted on by the attendees of that year's World Science Fiction Convention, or Worldcon. The one can also vote by just purchasing a supporting membership for that year. The Hugo has been awarded to such great books as Frank Herbert's Dune and Philip K. Dick's The Man in the High Castle. Why Orson Scott Card even got his publisher to delay his debut novel, Ender's Game, by a month so that Hugo voters would have more time to read it. This led to the novel becoming one of the most popular and beloved books of science fiction ever written, greatly in part because it won the Hugo. That was back when the award still meant something, before the widespread use of the internet made it possible for writers to game the system. But the organizers of the Hugo Award and Worldcon ignored Harlan Ellison's warning and didn't take the steps to fix the voting system. And the prestige of the award slowly degraded as the years went on, as works of lesser and lesser quality made it onto the ballot, such as Chicks Dig Time Lords and practically every episode of Doctor Who. That is, until 2013 when Larry Correa launched a campaign to get his book, Monster Hunter Legion, as well as a few other overlooked works of science fiction nominated for the Hugo Award. He was tired of how the Hugo voters had kept giving the award to heavy-handed message fiction about the dangers of fracking and global warming and dying polar bears and robot rape as a bad feminist analogy with a villain who is a thinly veined Dick Cheney. So instead of simply complaining about it, as many others previously had, he decided to actually do something about it. Every year, thousands of pulp writers slave away in the word mines for as little as five cents a word. Yet, despite providing hours of explosion-filled enjoyment for their readers, most pulp novelists will never be recognized by critics, and in fact, they will be abused by the literati elite. Literary critics stuffed this pulp novelist into a dryer and ran at high temperatures for nearly five minutes without even a sheet of fabric softener. For generations, literary critics and college English departments have looked down at pulp novelists and refused to give them awards. Even though those guys are totally freaking awesome, and Conan the Barbarian is a thousand times more awesome than The Great Gatsby, you wouldn't know it by listening to literary snobs. The hoity-toity literati snobs prefer heavy-handed, ham-fisted message fiction. Much like Michael Vick, literary critics hate pulp novelists and make them fight in vicious underground novelist fighting arenas. I actually did pretty good until Dan Wells made a shiv from a sharpened spoon and got me in the kidney. Never turn your back on the guy that writes about serial killers, I tell you what. Only you can stop literary snobs and their abuse of pulp novelists. And the first campaign was a huge success for practically everyone but Larry himself. While Monster Hunter Legion didn't make the Hugo ballot, elitist book reviews was nominated for Best Fanzine. Schlock Mercenary Random Access Memorabilia was nominated for Best Graphic Story. Vincent Chong was nominated for Best Pro Artist. And Tony Weisskopf was nominated for Best Professional Editor. Though the only work in this first Sad Puppies campaign to win a Hugo Award that year was the Writing Excuses podcast, which won for Best Related Work. The award for Best Novel that year went to a piece of Star Trek fanfiction called Red Shirts, written by prolific blogger John Scalzi. This was Scalzi's 10th nomination and his third Hugo win, giving Scalzi more Hugo awards than Philip K. Dick. And he achieved that with 
what was basically fan fiction. As you can see, there's totally no bias in the selection process at all, but we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Now Larry Correa was far from finished with the Hugo Awards, so the next year, he started the Sad Puppies 2 campaign. He held an open commenting thread on his blog, where he asked his fans for suggestions for his new recommendation list, and once again one of his own novels was right at the top of the list, Warbound, the third book in the Grim Noir Chronicles trilogy. However, this time he included a second recommendation for the best novel category, A Few Good Men by Sarah Hoyt. The Butcher of Cardov by Dan Wells and The Chaplain's Legacy by Brad Torgerson were suggested for the novella category. And the novelette category was The Exchange Officers, also by Brad Torgerson, and Opera Vita Eterna by Vox Day. So Larry's fans read the works he recommended and nominated for the Hugo Ballot accordingly. But before Worldcon released the nominations, they announced that Jonathan Ross was going to host the Hugo ceremony. Neil Gaiman had asked him to present the award, so Jonathan volunteered to do it free of charge. Though later he had to step down from the position, and I think the story about how this happened helps to illustrate the culture that formed around Worldcon. See, despite their website calling the Hugos science fiction's most prestigious award, the attending audience of Worldcon is actually rather small compared to that of other sci-fi cons let alone all of science fiction and fantasy's fandom as a whole. It's kind of strange that such a smaller convention would be the home of such an honored prize, but this episode should shine a light into at least one reason why Worldcon hasn't grown in all the years it's been around. See, Jonathan Ross is a comedian, and sure he's done some work writing sci-fi comics and had a minor voice acting role in Halo 3, and his wife Jane Goldman worked on the scripts for several fantasy movies, one of which won a Hugo Award. But none of that mattered, because he was a comedian and an outsider to the Worldcon crowd. It all started when two-time winner and 11-time Hugo nominee Seanan McGuire discovered that Jonathan was going to host the Hugo Award ceremony. Wait, wait, they're letting Jonathan Ross present the Hugos? What the fucking fuck? You know, I really enjoyed knowing that. Were I to be nominated for Hugo, the host wouldn't see me and make fat jokes. Like, that thought has actually crossed my mind when shopping for Hugo dresses. The host won't mock me. Also, call me, I don't know, strange. But I was told, when volunteering to host the Hugos, that the host would be from our community. Our community. Our community. Someone who got our community. Someone who could make Muppet jokes, like John Scalzi or be sweet to Jay Lake like Paul Cornell. Someone who actually understood the award and why we were there. Also, and this is not Sour Grape speaking, but I have volunteered to host the Hugos and I'm an award-winning stand-up comic. I'm not the only person from within the community to volunteer. I'm not the only one who's good on stage who knows how to work an event. So don't you even say, oh, we had to look outside for good talent because that's insulting, belittling, and a fucking lie. So congrats, LonCon 3! When people asked for a change in Hugo hosts, meaning something that wasn't more a white dude parade, you got a man who says things about women like me that I won't put on my Twitter. I am actually crying, LonCon 3. I was supposed to be safe at Worldcon. I was supposed to be safe at the Hugos. I voted for you, LonCon 3, because you said I'd be safe. How dare you, LonCon 3. How fucking dare you. One final note, LonCon 3, when multiple people say, my first thought was he'd call you fat. Maybe you picked the wrong man. And of course, this turned into a large shitstorm, where even more people got outraged over Jonathan Ross hosting the awards, and The Guardian even published a couple articles about it. And like I said, this led to Jonathan Ross stepping down from the position he volunteered to do. Honestly, if the mere possibility that someone might make a fat joke in your present upsets you that badly, then maybe it's because you know that being horribly overweight isn't a good thing, and that you need to readjust your lifestyle to be more healthy. But this was never just about offensive humor. It was clearly about an outsider coming in, and intruding on their territory despite Neil Gaiman inviting him to host. It is undeniable that he has contributed to the field of science fiction, and his wife has done likewise with her movie scripts, one of which won the award that he was going to present. So I suggest keeping in mind the reaction that Worldcon attendees had towards Jonathan Ross as we move forward, as it highlights the sort of people the Sad Puppy campaign was up against. A few weeks later, the Hugo nominees were announced, 
And this time, Larry's campaign to get one of his books on the ballot was a success, with Warbound taking the nomination, though Sarah Hoyt's A Few Good Men did not make the ballot, despite the narrator of the book being totally straight as an arrow. So it's strange that people were already claiming that he was somehow stuffing the ballot box, since if he were, wouldn't both books have received the same number of nominating votes, and as such, either both or neither got on the ballot? But Larry's book wasn't the main reason that they were outraged. See, Larry Correa is only a cis male gender normative fascist, whereas Vox Day is, quote, the most despised man in science fiction. To say that Vox Day's political opinions are controversial in the science fiction and fantasy fandom would be a bit of an understatement. Though instead of arguing against his statements, like Castalia House author John C. Wright has done, the secret masters of fandom just smeared him as a racist, sexist, homophobic dipshit and kicked him out of the science fiction writers of America. But since these smears were thrown around by high-profile, social justice-minded authors, they were believed without question among the Worldcon clique. A campaign to get good books onto the Hugo ballot was turned into a sexist and racist crusade to remove minority authors such as Patrick Nielsen Hayden and John Scalzi from the ballot. That's why the puppies nominated Bain editor Tony Weisskopf and Sarah Hoyt's A Few Good Men, a book with a narrator that's totally straight as an arrow. But because social justice warriors were totally outraged that such a supposedly horrible person like Fox Day was on the nomination ballot, they began plans for ensuring that his novelette would lose in last place, despite never having read the story at all. Tour editor Teresa Nielsen Hayden even defended the idea of voting no award above stories which one has not read. Why should I vote to tell the rest of the world that science fiction is a place where the only difference between James White and Fox Day is their commercially published texts? The awards we give out are a giant signal saying, this is what we love, this is what we value, this is what we think is important. Why the hell am I supposed to lie about what those things are? And this had the sort of effect on the winners that you would expect. Warbound finished in last place, just 160 votes ahead of No Award, losing to Ancillary Social Justice. And of course, Vox Day's novelette Opera Vita Eterna also finished in last place, behind No Award, since social justice warriors did as they promised and voted against it without even reading it. Now at first, Tony Weisskopf got the highest number of votes for Best Editor, but due to the Australian voting system, she ended up losing to Ginger Buchanan and finishing in fourth place. The way Hugo voting works is that you list who you're voting for in order of priority, and the nominee in last place is taken away and the votes are redistributed with each runoff. What this means is that rather than the best book taking home the award, it's the least controversial book that wins. If the United States had used this system for the last election, then Jeb Bush would have won in a landslide. So none of the works recommended on the Sad Puppies 2 list took home the award. But it wasn't a total loss. Larry took account of everyone who took part in the campaign, and he didn't see any indication of systemic voter fraud on the part of Worldcon, at least as far as he could tell. And hey, they certainly had fun reading the books and recommending them to other science fiction fans. But by now, you're probably wondering how things got this bad in the first place. How things could have gotten the way where the elderly old lady of Mars could win best novelette, or where a magic realism coming out story could win best short story. And I'm not even gonna get into if you were a scaly, my love. How could these stories be published as science fiction in the first place, you may wonder? Well, there are a couple theories about how the field has become this way, but we'll get to those a little later. Next year, Brad Torgerson convinced Larry Correa to continue the Sad Puppies for the third year in a row. While Larry had accomplished what he set out to do, investigate the allegations of voter fraud and expose the secret masters of fandom control over the Hugo Awards, Brad still held out hope that they could also accomplish the goal of getting good books on the ballot. So they returned once again with a list of recommendations for fans to nominate, this time including fantastic writers from all sorts of political persuasions, not just right-wingers. But Brad and Larry were not alone this year, as Fox Day was back once again with a separate Hugo nomination campaign of his own, which he called the Rabbit Puppies. Yes, Vox Day did not appreciate the way his work was treated the year before, with Hugo voters placing it last behind no award, when many of them openly admitted to not having read the work. The Rabid Puppies list differed somewhat from that of Sad Puppies 3. While Larry's goal for Sad Puppies was investigation, 
Vox Day's goal was instigation, as he set out to deny the social justice warriors from getting any Hugo Awards. To accomplish this, all he had to do was make sure that enough of his recommendations filled the ballot, so that there would be no room left for any of the social justice propaganda pieces that the Morlocks called science fiction. That way, there was little that their opposition could do to keep them from attaining some sort of victory. Either the Worldcon attendants would read the books, vote for them based on their merits, and give them to works of high quality, or they would vote no award for entire categories, burning down the whole show. In the case of the latter, it would go a long way to publicly show that the Hugo voter base marches in ideological lockstep. Anyway, because so many of the Morlocks refused to read the works on the Sad Puppies 2 list from the year before, Larry decided to hold a large book bomb to ensure that his suggested stories were the most read fiction in the field that year. The way a book bomb works is that everyone buys the book on the same day so that it goes up higher in the Amazon rankings, which means people searching the store categories find it as well. So because of this, it's undeniable that those who took part in the puppy campaigns did in fact read the works which they nominated, while the same cannot be said for the Morlocks. Later, when the nominations were announced, Worldcon decided that Yes, Virginia, There is a Santa Claus by John C. Wright wasn't eligible for the Best Novelette category, because John had posted the first draft of the book on the internet as he wrote it. And while Lines of Departure by Marco Cluse and Goodnight Stars by Annie Bellet both made the nomination, both authors withdrew their stories from the ballot because they did not wish to be part of the puppy campaigns. Also, Blackgate tried to withdraw as well, but they waited too long to decide, and it was too late for Worldcon to remove them from the ballot. But despite those authors fleeing from the award like the plague, the results were still quite in the favor of the puppies. Entire categories of the Hugo contained only nominations from that of the Sad Puppies and the Rabbit Puppy lists, such as Best Novella, Best Short Story, Best Related Work, and Best Editor, Long and Short Form. Many of the other categories only had one nomination that was not on either of the lists, such as the Novelette category, which would otherwise just have Rabbit Puppy recommendations if it wasn't for John C. Wright's disqualification. Hmm, strange that Yes, Virginia, There is a Santa Claus was disqualified, but Old Man's War by John Scalzi was still allowed in 2005, despite that book being free on the internet for three years before Tor published it. Even before the nominees were announced, the puppy campaigns were causing much distress among the Morlocks. But after the announcement, there was a misinformation blitz across many blogs in the mainstream media. The Hugo Awards were always political, but now they're only political, said ex-IO9 writer, now tour author, Charlie Jane Anders. Hugo Award nominations fall victim to misogynistic, racist voting campaign, said Isabella Biedenharn of Entertainment Weekly, though Entertainment Weekly later backtracked this statement when Larry Korea threatened a libel suit. Sci-fi's right-wing backlash. Never doubt that a small group of deranged trolls can ruin anything, even the Hugo Awards, said Arthur Chu of Salon. Wait a minute, isn't Arthur Chu's wife a science fiction writer herself? Oh, I'm sorry, his now ex-wife. But the real kicker is what Irene Gallo, creative director of Tor Books, said. She said, there are two extreme right-wing to neo-Nazi groups called the Sad Puppies and the Rabbit Puppies, respectively, that are calling for the end of social justice in science fiction and fantasy. They are unrepentantly racist, sexist, and homophobic. A noisy few, but they've been able to gather some Gamergate folks around them and elect a slate of bad to reprehensible works on this year's Hugo ballot. Well, that sounds familiar. Blame for Jan! Blame for Jan! Freedom of speech must be dispersed, my sensibilities must come first! <laughs> Than the rest of them, brother. I'm the best of them, tougher than my brethren. So you can call me Knuckles, cause when I swing these buckle. Oh no! Daddy Warbick posted a link to Larry Korea's book bomb in the Gamergate Twitter hashtag. This is even worse than when the Scientologists nominated L. Ron Hubbard's second Mission Earth novel. Now the Hugo Awards have been ruined forever! Ah! But of course, the unwashed gamer masses cannot be allowed to even touch the Hugo Award. As now former tour editor Teresa Nielsen Hayden explains, the Hugos don't belong to the set of all people who read the genre, they belong to the world con and the people who attend and or support it. The set of all people who read science fiction can start their own award. 
Sure, later she tried to backtrack it by claiming that she really meant the physical ownership of the award itself, while also using Darvo tactics to spin the sad puppies as the real greedy thieves who wanted to own the award all to themselves. Because that's why they nominated The Dark Between the Stars by Kevin J. Anderson, and published by Tor Books. You know, Tor Books, the company which Patrick Nielsen Hayden is the senior editor? But anyway, a few months later, the award ceremony began, and the Morlocks reacted just as predicted, by granting Best Novella, Best Short Story, Best Related Work, and Best Editor Long and Short Form to no award. See, the Hugos have this mechanism built in, where if the people voting are too snobbish to read or choose from the books that are actually on the ballot, they can vote to simply not give an award at all for that category. And that is exactly what they did. In the entire history of the Hugo Awards prior to this, no award has only been given out five times. For the 2015 Hugo Awards, that number doubled. And pretty much every other category had no award above the puppy suggestions, with Guardians of the Galaxy being the only work to escape this fate. And to add insult to injury, wooden asterisk plaques were given out to certain nominations. The asterisks were created by a guy called Jim Wright, alias Stone Kettle on Twitter, and he retweeted the following posts regarding the asterisks he created. Bruh Sam said, I really like how David Gerald lampshaded the asterisk for this year's Hugo Awards. We made history is what the asterisk means. J.M. Rooker said, the asterisks will always be there. A Hugo Award asterisk winning novel by your favorite author. Footnote, award given in 2015, the year voting was rigged. And Mamataz said, reminder that the asterisk is not just a notation for the Hugo nominations this year. Vonnegut used asterisk to represent asshole. Because the real fans didn't nominate them, so they're not legitimate nominations, even though those wrong fans still paid their 40 pieces of silver to Worldcon, just like everyone else. Worldcon eventually disavowed Jim and tried to forget the whole thing, but the damage had already been done. But not all hope was lost for the puppies, as we get to the category of Best Novel. While Skin Game by Jim Butcher and The Dark Between the Stars by Kevin J. Anderson finished under no award, there was one novel that Vox Day recommended which not only escaped the grip of no award, but managed to win the Hugo Award. The Three Body Problem by Sheen Liu, and translated by Ken Liu. See, after the nominees were announced, Vox Day suggested that his readers vote for The Three Body Problem, and Larry said that Vox would have included it in the Rabid Puppies list if he had read it sooner. If you look at the voting numbers, The Three Body Problem won by 200 votes, and according to Chaos Horizon, there were about 500 voters who took Vox's voting suggestions. This means that Vox Day and the Rabid Puppies were directly responsible for the Three Body Problem winning the Hugo Award for Best Novel. Oh, this is amazing! After three years, a puppy has finally won the Hugo Award! Science fiction has been saved from the evil warlocks! So what does this mean for the Three Body Problem? Oh, well, for an award as highly respected as the Hugos, an award given to such amazing authors as Harlan Ellison and Isaac Asimov and Orson Scott Card? It means selling 20,000 copies of your book total? Ah well, at least readers outside of America are buying it. And we can be assured that Sheen Liu is not a social justice warrior, because he specifically said that voting for his books just because he was Chinese was, quote, the best way to destroy the Three Body trilogy. Anyway, a closer look at the voting data shows that around 2,500 people voted in lockstep against the puppy suggested nominees. Now, at first, this seems like quite a large crowd of voters, until one realizes just how easy it would be to gather such a crowd. All one would need is at least 2,500 active Twitter followers and $100,000. Then purchase a Worldcon supporting membership for each of them and tell them to vote exactly as the anti-puppy list suggested. You can see part of this with Mary Cowell and her friends giving out 100 supporting memberships to their readers. Because the same person who said, quote, Dear 12 rabid weasels of the SFWA, please shut the fuck up, end quote. And Vox Day is the Donald Trump of science fiction. He's totally gonna give memberships out to people who will judge Vox Day's suggested works based on their merit. So this turns the voting process from a democracy into a circus, where one with vast amounts of disposable wealth has more say. Obviously after that shit show, they couldn't stop now, so in 2016, Kate the Impaler Polk announced that she was going to run Sad Puppies 4 The Embiggening, and Vox Day announced Rabbit Puppies 2 Make the Hugos Great Again. 
The Sad Puppies 4 list was democratically set up where anyone on the internet could vote for what they wanted on it, and the top 10 books would show up in the final list. Vox Day continued to handpick his suggestions, but this time his list was a little different from that of the year before, as he now included a few works which he suspected that Worldcon voters would not deny awards to. Among others, he suggested Obits by Stephen King for Best Novelette, The Sandman Overture by Neil Gaiman, and J.H. Williams III, former SFWA President Jerry Purnell for Best Editor Short Form, the Season 5 opener for My Little Pony Friendship is Magic, and Space Raptor Butt Invasion by Chuck Tinkle? Surely no one could deny such works as these, the golden toy rocket ships they so greatly deserve. For the 2016 nominations, Blackgate actually managed to withdraw in time, so it was replaced on the nomination ballot with Lady Business. Thomas A. Mays also withdrew his short story, The Commuter, which was replaced with Cat Pictures, Please by Naomi Kritzer. This meant that the short story category, which was otherwise swept with Rabid Puppies suggestions, now had one nomination slot given over to social justice propaganda. So besides best short story and best fanzine, Vox Day's recommendations managed to get all but one of the nominations for the best novella and best fan writer. Though his suggestions dominated the best novelette, best related work, best pro artist, best semi prosine, and best fan cast categories. And of course, the nomination results caused the usual outrage article blitz from mainstream blogs, though this time they blamed the alt-right instead of the Gamergate hashtag. So this brings us to the most recent Hugo Awards ceremony, and the results of it were... mixed. Best Short Story obviously went to the only nomination not on the Rabbit Puppy lists, and no award took home the prize in the Best Related Work and Best Fan Cast categories. However, Best Novelette went to Folding Beijing by Hao Jin Fang, translated by Ken Liu, despite the category being entirely rabid puppy suggestions. The Martian won Best Dramatic Presentation Long Form, though My Little Pony finished last, behind no award, losing to Jessica Jones. Predictably, Tony Wasekopf lost behind no award in the Best Editor Long Form category once again though Jerry Purnell also finished behind no award as well. The Sandman Overture won Best Graphic Story, but when Neil Gaiman accepted the award, he described the puppies as pitiable people. You know, the fans who nominated and voted for his book. And finally, we come to the Best Novel category, which they gave to the fifth season by some dude named N.K. Jameson? N.K.? 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 Uh, uh, oh. Oh my. <laughs> Ooh. But, but wait a minute. This raises an interesting question. We've been told for years that female authors who used pen names to hide their womanhood, either with initials or an androgynous name, had internalized misogyny and hated themselves. Why, half the time when someone tries to counter the narrative that there are no popular female authors in science fiction, we're told that the self-hatred that those authors apparently have means that they don't count. So why is Nora Jameson allowed to hide her identity as a woman from bookstore shoppers, while other female authors are not? Anyway, by this point, you're probably still wondering how the field of science fiction and fantasy managed to get this way, where stories like Sylveon Pictures, Please could ever be considered the best short story written in the current year. Well, there are a few running theories about this, and we have one of our own to share. Brad Turkerson equated Worldcon to a nail house, a holdout property created when science fiction was less popular than it is today. But then Star Wars came along and changed everything, and suddenly science fiction was wildly popular among the masses. Though Worldcon stayed small and exclusive despite this, with their attendance continuing to dictate to the world what sci-fi books were supposedly the best, with the Hugo Award. But that's not entirely accurate. I mean, sure it's true that Worldcon attendees are a playing tastemaker, but if that was all they were doing, then the problem would be self-correcting. There's another part of the story here that we're missing. See, the narrative that the genre of science fiction was never popular is actually a myth. In Appendix N of the Dungeon Master's Guide for Dungeons and Dragons, Gary Gygax recommended a list of authors and stories that he was inspired by, so that others could read them and be inspired to tell stories of their own. Jeffro Johnson wrote about this in his book about Appendix N, the final chapter of which, called Appendix N Matters, was on the Rabid Puppies list. In it, he talks of the old science fiction and fantasy canon of Appendix N, the stories that everyone who was a fan of the genre had read. Stories that have been mostly forgotten now. 
though he did find that the Sands of Time swept away these stories right around the time when Star Wars and the Sword of Shannara came out. But something else happened around that time as well that my partner Dan and I realized. Yuri Bezmenov, former KGB propagandist, was interviewed in 1985, where he talked about how the far left could take over a nation. The first step in this takeover he called demoralization. So when you read these stories from the Appendix N list and compare them with more contemporary examples of sci-fi and fantasy, it becomes obvious what is happening. The themes of heroism and sense of wonder, the sort of stories about traveling to far off planets and becoming king, they had to go away because it worked as a counter to the propaganda machine. If the general public were to become demoralized anti-Americans who believed that nothing they did mattered because everything was pointless, then they would need to be fed stories that forced such beliefs on them. Which is why the original science fiction and fantasy canon had to be brushed away. Why academics and feminist bloggers wrote pieces condemning the stories as all flavors of problematic. So that new, realistic tales of science fiction, tales that were nothing more than social justice sermons, would be all that was left of the field. But they didn't count on us returning to the old books and breaking their narratives that the works that founded the genre of science fiction and fantasy were too problematic for everyone to really enjoy them. Already, Sad Puppies 5 has been announced, being run by Sarah Straight as an Arrow Hoyt, but it's now just an awareness campaign for works of science fiction. And I'm sure that Vox Day will continue his quest to ensure that the Hugo Award is kept out of the hands of the Morlocks. Plus, if Castalia House continues to sign on authors of such a high caliber as Jerry Pornell, then I'm sure it won't be long before they overtake Tor. And the operation that Jeffrey Johnson started with his Appendix N posts looks very promising, but that's a story for another time. Oh, by the way, I just wanted to mention something before we go. John Scalzi said that video content is eligible for the best related work category, so please be sure to nominate this video for the Hugo Award next year.